Hi, everyone. I'm Tiffany Rad, and uh, I love coming to the NDC conferences because I get to talk to you about some of the stuff that I do that might be outside of the realm of some of the work that you do with development. I am a computer science professor at the University of Maine, so I have done development work, but I teach my students about security. In particular, I teach them how to be hackers. And every student graduating from the computer science department has to take my class. Um, and it's been like this for, well, I've been teaching there for 13 years. So we've, we've graduated a lot of students who uh, have learned about the process of thinking like a hacker so that they can design code in a way that's more secure. So let me tell you a little bit about my background because it's a little bit different than others in cybersecurity. Uh, so I run a, a startup right now out of the Washington DC area. And uh, what we do is we do signals intelligence on vehicles. So I look at cars and without putting anything inside, I look at the signals emanating from the vehicles to determine if there's anything unique about them. So this is what I do is I have sensors and we, we learn about how vehicles work, how they connect with infrastructures, with other vehicles. So I base this presentation off of some of the work that I have done uh, learning about these systems. And I'm not an auto engineer. Uh, I learned about this stuff through uh, really breaking, cracking, however, uh, hacking sometimes has a negative Im implication, but not in my class at the university. But I learned about these systems by accessing computers uh, 10 years ago was some of the first work that I did getting into computer networks to see how they work. So I'll tell you a little bit about what I've learned from this and how I teach my students and encourage them if they're interested in computer security, having a bachelor's degree or, or background in programming, software and hardware engineering is a fantastic place to start. So there's some people, and I say, unless you're in your 20s and currently enrolled in a uh, degree program now, I don't know too many people that have a degree in cybersecurity. My students are computer science students that are graduating, but they, at, they augment their education with some stuff that I've encouraged them to do. So I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go through and how to think like this and how to make whatever software, hardware, whatever you're developing right now, how to make it more secure by thinking this way. Um, I've worked for some really big companies <laughs> and uh, part of the reason I think is um, that I started my, my own too is I wanted to uh, create some projects and, and do some experimentation that is uh, a little bit different than what we did, but I worked for Cisco and you'll see on there, I worked for Kaspersky Labs. I was on their great team. Their great team is based in Moscow. I was one of, I think, two Americans on that team. And I worked there about six years ago. So times were very different uh, back then with US and Russian relations. But I learned a lot, and I did malware analysis for them. So it didn't really have to do with cars. But every bit along the way, I, I learned more about how, how things work by taking things apart. And when we got pieces of malware, we took them apart. And I went to work there because uh, the person I worked for was one of the two that discovered Stuxnet. So I was very intrigued to learn about how they, they figured out that, well, they knew it was new, but how did it work? What did it target? There was there malware that came before it that was intelligence gathering before they released Stuxnet. It was a very exciting time. And uh, I really enjoyed working there at that, uh, during that period of time. Uh, at Battelle, um, that was one of the first jobs where I took a hobby of mine, which is really learning how cars work, and I was able to do this for the uh, for defense contractor. So we were given a vehicle, and we literally took it apart to figure out how it worked. And the team was made up of not just um, people that had some backgrounds in software engineering, but we had a mechanical engineer, and some people that were cybersecurity, like me, was self-taught. You just had to learn it back then on your own. And I'm gonna tell you about some of the resources for doing that if you're interested in this kind of career or making a change or even better <laughs> to is augmenting some of this, uh, the way of thinking like a hacker into how you develop your programs and encouraging your employer to not look at hacker as being a bad, scary word. Uh, so if someone reports a problem to you, 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 it's good. You want this to happen. You don't wanna read about it in like the New York Times. You want your company to be able to respond. So I'll tell you about some of the ways that that's happening. Uh, I teach in the computer science department and I've done some work in the media, I suppose. <laughs> I don't know if I've, it was, some of it was accidental. I published a white paper uh, following a DEF CON presentation. I did industrial control system hacking research too. And uh, back in 2011, uh, in a period of two weeks, a team of four of us uh, was able to write a, a zero day, which means that it was something completely new, the vendor didn't know. We wrote a zero day, we never released it. 
but we did it for the purpose is to show that there were vulnerabilities in systems where everyone was saying there were not. So we set up a system, bought some software, and the software controlled how prison, jail, doors, uh, even gates, all the way out to the edge of the prison could all be open and accessed remotely. So uh, that was back in 2011. Things have changed since then. Um, uh, but uh, Mr. Robot, you see here at the bottom, they saw our white paper, uh, the writers did online, watched our DEF CON presentation, and I was on vacation at the beach and I get a call from our, the exploit dev that was on our team, and he said, uh, our stuff's on Mr. Robot. In fact, like our white paper is like on the screen. <laughs> you can see our names on it. And I'm like, oh wow, that's really cool. So when people say, I didn't write from Mr. Robot, I don't have any affiliation with it, but they read the white paper and then the whole episode is based on uh, a character needing to break someone out of prison. And uh, I, when I communicated later with um, the writer and the technical advisor for Mr. Robot, I said, you guys in that episode put our, my team's worst nightmares, like <laughs> you made it for us because this was the thing we were most worried about is when you do exploit development or you're thinking about mm, breaking industrial control systems for things like prisons, that someone's gonna say, you, you know, you come work for us, <laughs> we're gonna make you. Luckily that didn't happen to us. We didn't have a life like Elliot and Mr. Robot, but it was very interesting to see, um, see that. And uh, I did do something where we, we took apart uh, Die Hard. It's the one with the computer hacking. We went through and pretty much said that couldn't happen like that, that couldn't happen like that, and maybe that one could. Yeah, because Die Hard, a lot of things blow up. And people think that when a data center goes, it's like, you know, it's, uh, so um, we did this and, um, uh, and alongside of us, uh, but apart from us, there, I suppose, was an FBI agent who did a lot of work like that. So luckily our analyses um, were the same. <laughs> so here's the agenda. So I hope that you like Tron, because I love Tron. Yes, okay, I love Tron. And a lot of my students now at the university have no idea, they've never seen it because they're like, oh, that's an old movie. And I'm like, if you're a developer, you're, you gotta watch Tron. There's so much in there. So I'm going to be using some inspiration from Tron through the presentation. <laughs> also, Cory Doctorow, have, has, have most people heard of Cory Doctorow? Yep, he, okay, so he wrote a book called Little Brother. But most people don't know that he wrote a fantastic short, uh, short story that was more like an audio file, and I'll, I'll play small clips of it for you about car hacking. And he took, again, car hacker's worst nightmare in a sense and like put it, put it to, uh, to a fictional story. But what's interesting about it is a lot of the pieces in there aren't actually fictional. And he did this, I think it was two years ago, and some of these things have actually come out to play. I mean, in a sense that they have, they've happened. Cory Doctor is a futurist in that sense that I think that he thinks about things that haven't happened yet and then things do. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk to you about your code as well. Does anyone think that if you wanted to access your car computer right now and you had to crack some encryption to get to the code, even if this is your car that you own, that you bought, this isn't a rental, this isn't someone else's vehicle, could you access the code right now to see what your, code, what your car is storing about you? What, how the program works? Does anyone think you can? Okay, you can now, but for a very short period of time. And I'm gonna tell you about uh, some legislation right now that needs to be renewed so you can see what your car is, is, is how it works, what it's, uh, what it's storing and recording about you. The only part it doesn't work is that little, as they call it, the black box. You cannot touch or access that. And that's the crash data, well, it's, it's like the crash data recorder in airplanes, but uh, you, event data recorder is what they call it for vehicles. But I'll tell you more details about that. And why being able to see the code and the products that you use, that you create, if you happen to work for some of these companies is important. And if you see something, say something. I don't like the way TSA uses it, but um, when you work on a team, it's important. And I've, uh, I've worked for some big companies and some of them have not been very, how shall I say, uh, welcoming even when an employee goes to someone in upper management and says, hey, there's a problem with this code. I think it's either a safety or security issue. Can, can you help us change this? And one of the companies I worked for, it was like a risk of getting fired if you did that. And looking at, you saw where I worked. It may not be the company that you think it is, but I won't say. But I will use examples of how you can help change the culture um, with the development teams at your company because it's really important to be able to do that and to encourage your employer 
We need to set up bug bounty and welcome this kind of stuff coming in. Teach your employees to think like hackers. If they want training, give it to them. <laughs> so and it doesn't have to be super expensive training. I'm going to show you some stuff and talk about some stuff that my students use that's free and online. So you can get your employees started on this stuff. So all right. So now to talk about the vehicles. All right, so I love this with Tron because I hope everyone has seen the movie, but literally you become the motorcycle in Tron. When you hold this wand, it's, it's built around you. And with the cars today, this is true. So it's true with this car. Okay, this is, this is actually a real picture. I did not take it. That's a GTR. And I'll tell you, I would love to have a GTR as a research vehicle. It's, that's how I would write it off if I uh, purchased one with my company. I don't have a reason to yet, but I want one. But I would love to have it look like Tron. But and more realistically, this is what I work on. <laughs> this isn't my car per se, but uh, this is just a general American-made vehicle. And the reason we do a lot with American-made vehicles is they're easy to find here. They're cheap. You can get some even from three years ago. They're highly connected. There's a lot going on in here. There's some cars that are, how shall I say, like some of the more expensive higher end cars have as much code running in them as, as, a, as an airplane. <laughs> so these are computers. When you sit in this car, even this one, this is a 2008 for the same type that I recently rented on a trip. And it has so much code in it running and it's getting so much information too. Before you get in one of these, just like a heads up, um, <laughs> we used to tell our execs and, and the companies too, we'd brief them turn off Wi-Fi, turn off Bluetooth, maybe even turn off the location stuff if you don't need it. Because when you sit in some of these cars, it immediately starts trying to pull it. Do you want to connect? Oh, this you have this open, you must want to connect. I get into some rental cars and I see people's contact lists, phone numbers. <laughs> so uh, that so stuff can get stored because you know when, these, when the rental car agencies purchase these cars, they're not made to be rental cars, it's a car. So anyone who gets in it, when their contacts upload, see, so don't ever let that happen. <laughs> so I also never plug it into the Ethernet port in a car. So just a, a tip there on some cybersecurity for executives and all of you while you travel. So, all right, I love this scene from this, um, which is about you. your vehicle knows you. And soon your vehicle with DSRC, which is a shortwave radio communication between your car and the infrastructure, is gonna know a lot more about not just you, but where you're going and the stuff around you too. So I hope this isn't, this audio isn't too loud. Okay. It's about the grid. The grid. A digital frontier. I tried to picture clusters of information as they moved through the computer. What did they look like? Ships, motorcycles. Were the circuits like freeways? I kept dreaming of a world I thought I'd never see. And then, one day... You got in. <laughs> That's right, ma'am. I got in. I say I love that quote. Um, one of the reasons I, I love this is ships, motorcycles. Think about it like this, too. Trucks with auto. Uh, auto is a um, one of the self-driving trucks that's on the roads now in Arizona. Um, and with ships, even ships are super connected right now. If you go on a cruise ship, you're going to have industrial control system computers on there and a CAN bus, which is really interesting to me. Um, airplanes have industrial control systems and a CAN bus. So when you learn about how these networks work, when you look at a system uh, on the grid, how shall we say, it's the same thing. If you learn how the CAN bus network works, which is a very, very simple old network that was designed pretty much so, every, every small computer that controls stuff in the car on the network, it's just like a ring. It's one signal sent. Does anyone listen to this? Is everyone listening? <laughs> and so um, a lot of the vehicles and the older ones don't have anything like a gateway saying, OK, this signal must only go to this to control this aspect of the car. A way a lot of the vehicles work is if it hears brake. Every, every one of these systems gets, gets the signal brake. And that's how it can happen. Um, the braking occurs on the vehicle. But um, the gateways make it a little bit safer. There have been some recent hacks, like uh, just two weeks ago, VW, uh, there was a, some researchers did a responsible disclosure to VW, VW about a year ago, saying that there was an issue with the gateway. They were able to repair that for cars that were manufactured now, or from the disclosure date till now. But for the older vehicles that had this type of vulnerability, and uh, it's in the firmware, how do you fix that? 
when you have a car that doesn't have over-the-air updates like, uh, like Tesla's do, for instance, it makes it a problem because it's really hard to get the fix process. Uh, Ford had done this in the past where they sent out USBs. I remember a member of my family got one, thought it was like for music, and it never got plugged in, <laughs> so uh, that fix didn't happen. And um, again, if you go to the manufacturer to have your car serviced and stuff like that, but many of us don't. We go to the local station down the road who does these repairs and they may not know uh, how to do a lot of these updates or that it's important <laughs> or that a recall has been issued. So um, we, uh, the, the, we are on the grid. Everything that we use and we do, our phones, even um, on the plane yesterday, I had uh, my Bluetooth headphones on and I saw, I, could, I knew from my system, others were trying to connect to it. Um, everything that we do is connected. And I have done IoT presentations for NDC in the past but vehicles were a part that I wanted to focus on because it's such an important part of what we do and how we get around every day. And uh, I know some of the text is really small on here, but this is also how we are part of the grid. These are the IoT, IoT things that are connected and the stuff that I'm focusing on now on some projects. And at the end, I'm gonna tell you about some of these government projects and legislation and how it will affect how everything communicates and how people in the government communicate about risk. But cities, buildings, power grids, uh, these are things that we've looked at. Some people I know have done medical device hacking. Uh, there was a project last year, and I think it just became public now once they've gone through and sanitized all the reports, but a group was allowed to hack a 777 Dreamline, Dreamliner airplane, and this is supposed to be Boeing's most sophisticated plane. They were able to get a lot of communications to the plane that had not been found before. So um, it was something that was unexpected, and, but they're making the repairs. But it was really cool that, uh, the, the, I think it was, um, it was a couple of groups in the government allowed this to happen. So they allowed hackers to take a look at it because one of the things between development and the red team type of stuff is a different way of thinking, generally, the way that people are educated, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so I'm training my cybersecurity, <laughs> I'm training cybersecurity into my, my development uh, engineers that are coming out of uh, University of Maine. And um, it's a different way of, of thinking, but it's something that can be taught. And uh, I, uh, I didn't have this type of background. I mean, this is self-taught, like I said, um, but my dad worked for the government and it's a lot of things that I learned from him because he worked for the CIA on the operations side. So I grew up picking locks and people were like, why is that fun? <laughs> like, well, how is that related to security? If you go to any security conference, you will see a big lock picking village. Go try it if you can. People are like, why do they allow you to pick um, handcuffs? Well, these are supposed to be high security handcuffs and some of them are really easy to pick. And why should you learn this? Why is it important? It's a way of thinking that you think this is high security. You think that you're not gonna be able to break it. This lock has all these pins in it. How can I ever pick that? But you can, you can learn. And it's a way of thinking how to, through trial and error, that didn't work, that didn't work. That's often how we do this on red team work that I do too. I did red team work both on buildings software and also all the way down to the hardware level. Like what can we do to force this to give us the crypto key? Um, but it's a way really of, of thinking about it. So don't trust that if just because something says it's high security that it is. So now let me tell you a little bit about Cory Doctorow's Car Wars. Okay, so the, um, if, you, if you look this up, it's about, I think it's about a 30, 35 minute um, audio, uh, audio file. I listened to it after leaving actually the NDC conference in Norway last year. I took a little trip up to Scotland, listened to this on the way back down. I'm like, I have an idea for another presentation that's gonna focus on vehicles. Okay, so one of the things that in computer science we've thought about perhaps um, uh, is the trolley problem. When you're doing programming, how do you make this decision? Especially if it's one related to, and I'll, I'll reference this with like with Uber, what has happened recently with the self-driving vehicles and the accidents. So. This is the trolley problem as described Since by Since 1967, Doctor. ethicists have been asking hypothetical problems about who should be killed by runaway trolleys, whether it was better to push a fat man onto the tracks because his mass would stop the trolley, or let it crash into a crowd of bystanders, whether it made a difference if the sacrificial lamb was a good person or a bad one, or whether the alternative fatalities would be kids or terminally ill people or... The advent of autonomous vehicles was a bonanza for people who like this kind of thought experiment. If your car sensed that it was about to get into an accident, should it spare you 
or others. Governments convened secret roundtables to ponder the question, and had even come up with ranked lists. Saving three children in the car tops saving four children on the street, but three adults would be sacrificed to save two kids. It was a harmless and even cute diversion at first, and it gave people something smart-sounding to say at lectures and cocktail parties. But outside the actual software design teams, no one asked the important question. If you were going to design a car that specifically tried to kill its owners from time to time, how could you stop those owners from reconfiguring those cars to never kill them? Samuel had been in those meetings, where half-bright people from the old-line automotive companies reassured quarter-bright bureaucrats from the transport ministries that there'd be no problem designing tamper-proof cars that would resist end-user modification. Meanwhile, much brighter sorts from the law enforcement side of the house licked their chops and rubbed their hands together at all the non-trolley problems that could be solved if cars could be designed to do certain things when they got signals from duly authorized parties. Especially if the manufacturers and courts would collaborate to keep the inventory of those special cases as secret as the child porn block lists on the national firewalls. He'd been in the design sessions after, when they debated how they'd hide the threads and files for those programs, how they'd tweak the car's boot cycle to detect tampering and alert the authorities, how the diagnostic tools provided to mechanics for routine service checks could be used to double-check the integrity of all systems. But then he'd started getting signed, obfuscated blobs from contractors who served governments around the world, developing emergency priority apps he was just supposed to drop in without inspecting them. Of course he ran unit tests before Huawei shipped updates, and when they inevitably broke the build, Samuel would go around and around with the contractors, who'd want access to all his source code without letting him see any of theirs. It made sense for them to behave that way. If he failed to help them get their code into Huawei's fleet, he'd have to answer to governments around the world. If they failed to help him, they'd have to answer to precisely no one. Unit tests were one thing, real-world performance was something else. Sensors couldn't tell a car whether it was about to crash into some pedestrians, or a school bus, or an articulated lorry full of dynamite. All sensors could do was sense, and then feed data to machine learning systems that tried to draw conclusions from those data. Even with all the special cases about what the car must and must not do under which circumstances, machine learning systems were how it knew what the circumstances were. Okay, so with the Since trolley... Since 1967, Oops, sorry. Sorry. ethicists have been asked... Okay, there's, with the trolley problem, this is traditionally what it's looked like in computer science. You may have seen this in your classes about, so if you pull the switch, if, if someone pulls the switch, which way does it go? And uh, the ethicists have weighed the better part of doing that. But here's the problem with the trolley problem, is who controls the code? So truly, who is pulling that lever? Is it the politicians, is it uh, people that work for large corporations, or is it the developer, the coder, the person who is actually developing these kinds of systems that go into the cars? So um, there are two ways to go with this. So you said that I love the idea that companies have like bug, bug bounty programs. They're like, we want to know when there are problems. We want people to report this without feeling that they're going to be prosecuted. Um, on the other hand, we don't want anyone in our systems. We don't want anyone looking at them because someone's going to do something to tamper with the code, and that's very dangerous. So we can't let anyone see what the code says or does. So there are two things to weigh here. <laughs> so has anyone seen the Car Hacker's Handbook? OK, great. This is great. One of my friends wrote this book, and a bunch of car hackers got together and wrote a book, and it is free. Uh, through, you, know, you can purchase like a hard copy uh, softbound book one from No Starch Press. So here is the link to it. If you are interested in just tinkering with your car and learning how stuff works, uh, get this handbook. It's fantastic. Craig Smith is a very good car hacker. Okay, so the problem with it is, with the trolley problem, okay, so and I know uh, there's so much about the trolley problem, like with the, the crashes that have happened recently with Uber. Here's the problem. People could change the way cars are programmed. So. Hackers, for instance, or security researchers, or uh, someone who buys a vehicle that just wants to be the one to control how the code works could get access to this. So there's some laws that prohibit this, and there's some recent mm, ways that you can do security research, as long as it's not for profit, is one of the, the keys for this. And I'm going to show you the four things you need to do to do the security research on the car to make it legal. 
Um, but this is one of the problems. Do manufacturers work really hard and enforce locking people out at the risk of not getting people to report bugs or problems? Or do they, let, do they not, um, how shall I say, <laughs> enforce uh, so many of the criminal and, and intellectual property violation laws and want people to do this? There, let me tell you about some programs at the end that there are some opportunities to hack cars legally, and I'm gonna tell you how to do it. But um, this is one of the pieces of legislation that stops you from opening up code that you don't own. So you may think that you owned your car, but you actually have a license to the software. You don't own it. You own the metal, you own the leather in the car, but not what runs on it. And you're not allowed to open it up to look at it if there's a technological measure in place. And this is one of the keys to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. What is a technological measure? Some car companies say, well, we know when someone has broken it, when a security researcher's gone too far because they must have broken the crypto. We have like crypto protection to be able to see the code doing this. I have seen, not, not from car, a car manufacturer, but another type of manufacturer, that if you opened up the code and took a look at how it worked, it was literally written in the comments. If you go beyond um, this comment in the code, you are violating the DMCA. There may be criminal and civil violations that, that, you've, you know, that you've done. And uh, that's not a technological measure, is it? But would you want to be the security researcher that goes to present at DEF CON and then has someone later saying, or, well, you're going to be the first case. We're going to see if this is a technological measure and you know, we're going to sue you. You don't want to be that, that first test case for that kind of stuff. So there is something to be done about this. But, okay, so manufacturers can either go one way, bug bounty programs, hiring hackers onto this security team who think a little bit differently when they're doing the development, working with the developers, working with management. And then there's another way of doing it, which John Deere has done it this way. Lock it all down and enforce, enforce this with the DMCA if anyone violates it. So here's another small clip that I want to uh, I want to play for you. But uh, in, in brief, John Deere decided to do this, and these tractors, for those of you who who are not from uh, <laughs> rural areas, are very expensive. Some of these are over a hundred thousand dollars. And for John Deere to say, if you have a problem and you want to fix it on your tractor that you paid 130, 150 thousand for, um, you're going to have to hire a big truck to come a crane to lift that massive like, you know, farm vehicle up onto the truck, and by the time you've spent a few thousand dollars getting it to a John Deere dealer from wherever your farm is, that's just the beginning. Then they're gonna run their diagnostics. They wanna fix their stuff. They want the right to repair their stuff. So John Deere has, has done this, and then when there was an, an exemption uh, with the Copyright Office, so what this means is a bunch of people, including the Electronic Frontier Foundation, got together and said, we, these, these people want the right, to know what's running on their cars, their tractors. An exemption also is for voting machines and medical devices. All these things they want to know with their vulnerabilities on it because it affects critical infrastructure pol you know, politics in the US. It's a big deal. For tractors, 40,000 people <laughs> compl well, complained in a sense, told the US Copyright Office, include farm vehicles in that, please. We want to be able to access this. So here's another uh, audio file. And with Cory Doctor describing Burbank High, zero what tolerance can reminder. If you can't hack stuff. Dear parents, I hate to start the year with bad news, but I'd rather it be this than a letter of condolence to a parent whose child has been killed in a senseless wreck. Again, this is fiction. I'm As you were notified out. in your welcome pack, Burbank High has a zero tolerance policy on unsafe automotive practices. We welcome healthy exploration, and our IT program is second to none in the county. But when students undertake dangerous modifications to their cars and bring those cars to campus, they are not only violating Board of Education policy, they're violating federal laws and putting other students and our wider community at risk. Though the instructional year has only just started, we've already confiscated three student vehicles for operating with unlicensed firmware. And one of those cases has been referred to the police as the student involved was a repeat offender. Tomorrow, we will begin a new program of random firmware audits for all student vehicles on and off campus. These are not optional. We are working with Burbank PD to make them as quick and painless as possible, and you can help by discussing this important issue with your child. 
Burbank PD will be pulling over vehicles with student parking tokens and checking their integrity throughout the city. As always, we expect our students to be polite and respectful when interacting with law enforcement officers. This program starts tomorrow. Students caught with unlicensed vehicle modifications will face immediate two-week suspensions for a first offense and expulsion for a second offense. These are in addition to any charges that the police choose to lay. Parents, this is your chance to talk to your kids about an incredibly serious matter that too many teens don't take seriously at all. Take the opportunity before it's too late. For them, for you, and for the people of our community. Thank you, Dr. Hartunian, school principal. This is one of the things I love about Cory Doctorow is um, it's kind of like the John Deere example. For safety, for your safety and safety of your crops and all that, we're locking you out of the software on your farm vehicle. Will there come a time, as Cory Doctorow has, has predicted, that perhaps we won't be allowed to access the firmware and the software on our cars? It was like that before. We have an exemption right now that's going for, uh, I think, another year or two. And I'm going to show you that it's up for renewal now. But if not enough people say something about it that you want to be able to access and look at your code, um, make modifications to it, perhaps, it, the exemption is going to expire. And we'll be back to a point where you can't. So um, so uh, this, is, this is one of the examples I thought with John Deere that fit this, this from Cory Doctorow was, will there be a time when they're going to be random checks where, you know, uh, it, it is true that if you do take your car to the dealer, uh, when they plug in their diagnostic tool, they can tell if things have been modified and if there certain parts have been accessed. So um, you may be voiding your warranty if you use your car as a car hacking uh, learning tool. Uh, you may be voiding your warranty. So I also pose that, uh, <laughs> that warning to people when you're learning about this. You, you need to check. Okay. Um, so the fight for repair. Um, this is what the DMCA and something that uh, I, I, I urge you to check out and I'm going to show you actually if you want to do modifications and see how this works this is how you do it okay there are four rules for staying safe legally <laughs> if you want to access your car or tractor or voting machine or medical device you must get things legally you cannot go to Pirate Bay and download the code because that's not considered to be legal when I did my industrial control system research um, for a particular manufacturer I knew the code was on Pirate Bay but I knew if I presented at DEF CON that would be a big problem so we paid two thousand dollars to be able to uh, <laughs> to access this code now mind you we didn't crack or break anything when we did this research but we did want to see how things operated like the HMI so um, make sure that it's legal okay here's the second one um, it has to be good faith security research so they can't catch that you have written some as you saw with the tractor some like um, uh, Ukrainian black market firmware that you're selling in the dark market for 20 bucks a pop as is very popular with people that has the John Deere tractors um, it needs to be for good faith research so um, you, that's up to you how you define good faith research but if they find that you're making a, a profit on the dark market about that I think you're gonna lose that <laughs> um, so here it is uh, you, there is an exemption so you're allowed to do this now with your vehicles but it may not always be this way so it's renewal pending through 2021 so if <laughs> look at the dates and I'm going to show you where to look for this kind of stuff because I think a lot of security researchers are like oh no problem now that the copyright office has allowed this I'm going to go do it check the dates because from when it was announced there were people already starting but they had to start after 2000 like that date on October 16th and you know with the law they're very strict about dates so do check that um, it also requests but does not require responsible disclosure so what that means is if the vehicle well actually I can every American manufacturer card that I can think of right now has a some type of bug bounty disclosure program some will give you some money some will give you some <laughs> Like a pat on the back and that's great thanks for helping us out and for helping us improve safety for all Americans but every American car company has a type of program a place you can go where you don't have to like go to the legal team for instance which is pretty scary to talk to them but uh, engineers who are technical that you can describe your problem or the vulnerability you found to them so um, that's what's called responsible disclosure and uh, they can't require it because it's not required by law for security research but 
Um, it's something that you should think of doing. Okay, so as of just, even just like uh, less than two weeks ago, well, I guess it was more than two weeks ago, right now, really the decision is being made at Library of Congress, will this exemption continue? So this was, um, actually I got this online. This was uh, when the hearing was, so it's open to the public too. So if you have, if you, if you can go in and say, hey, I've been working on this project and this is how the DMCA has kind of slowed me down from making this innovation or from finding these security vulnerabilities. This one was for um, computer programs repair, but this one is for security research. And look at how many are for and against. So the Copyright Office, it's like, it is a hearing. They listen to people saying, we don't want this, this is gonna cause some problems for us, this is going to cause safety um, issues for people. And then there are others that are saying this is gonna improve safety. It's going to make things better really for, our, for the companies and things like that. So this debate was going on, um, they have it in DC and in LA, depending on which coast you're on, so you can participate in this type of discussion. You've missed the hearing date, but do watch because we don't know if it's going to get renewed or not. The exemption may, just sunset out in 2021. And then car hacking research is gonna go back to the days where when people give presentations at DEF CON, you, can, you have to hint around how you got into this place to find the vulnerability. Because if you're too explicit and if you actually say, well, I broke this crypto to get here, that, that's a trigger there for a problem with the DMCA, <laughs> possibly even the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is rather vague, vague when it comes to authorized access. All right, so. One of the things about digital locks that Cory Doctorow has quoted and said is, the locks are there really so that you, when you purchase this device, you gotta go and get a business or a product to help you look at it and see what it does. But it doesn't always have to be like that. Okay, so with security research and understanding how the development cycle works with stuff with vehicles, these are the things that I look at. So with a vehicle, one of the things I look at is first, what can you see from the outside? So software-defined radio is a really great place to start. It's free. You can either buy uh, some antenna, build your own, but software-defined radio is easy to use. And uh, I mean, some of these you're not gonna be able to pick up with SDR, such as like in the cellular, the cellular uh, networks, but uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, TPMS, this type of stuff is what I look at <laughs> and understand how the car is communicating with the infrastructure. Now mind you, the infrastructure has a lot to do with critical infrastructure as well because transportation vehicles are part of it. Uh, this is a prettier graphic that FireEye has put out of, um, of how they look at and what car hackers would look at thinking about how a car is developed. So no matter if you're really looking at the offensive way of accessing and learning about cars or if you're a developer working on improving software, know how these things work. It's a different way of thinking. If you're working on, for instance, uh, the drivetrain or something like that for vehicles, and it's really more internal. How do you make it work efficiently? Understanding how people can take what you've done and some of that work and access it in ways that you didn't intend is just a different way of looking at this. So again, um, one of the cool things that I'll, I'll show you are some programs where we take engineers, uh, mechanical engineers or software engineers, and we let them hack the cars. And these are some people that have built the, the development of the software in the car. And they, they're like, wow, you know, that's really interesting to learn how that kind of stuff works. So um, this is one of the projects that I'm working on. Cars are pro part of the infrastructure. The infrastructure is important to critical infrastructure protection in the US. So um, it's another reason why um, uh, even hacking with tractors is something that the government is watching because <laughs> Farming and the pr production of those products is part of critical infrastructure and must be protected in the US. But when everything, I mean, I'll show you about the levels of autonomy. Tractors and farm equipment has truly reached a level where it's remotely controlled. I, I have seen some vehicles, massive farm vehicles, that wherever the control center is for these really big farms, because this, this equipment's expensive, I wouldn't see a small farmer with this, uh, the program, tells it where to drive, how deep to plant the seed, how to change the fertilizer, and like uh, anything that if someone were to access that and change even the GPS location of where the tractor is, if you're just a little bit off from where you think the seeds are going down, you could cause an entire crop failure. So this kind of stuff is important to protect, but learning about where the problems are in these systems is crucial to training the developers and the engineers to be able to make these fixes. 
So the connected roadway infrastructure, and this is where I'm gonna talk a lot about <laughs> um, autonomous vehicles. Semi-autonomous vehicles is what I'd more like to call them because they are not fully autonomous and won't be for a while. So um, this is how, when, uh, when I look at signals on a roadway, this is kind of what it looks to me, but this is also what it'll look with D DSRC. And the people will ask me too, with all that you do in security, do you, would you want an autonomous vehicle? <laughs> Do you want a coffee maker that sends you an email when the coffee's made? Do you want an oven that tells you you can control from your office to turn on or shut off? Uh, and I do, I do, because I work in the tech sector. I love this stuff. I am a gadget person, I must admit. I do look at everything also from a perspective of has there been a vulnerability or an exploit that's been released publicly about this device before I buy it? Um, I do look at that. Um, but I also want this stuff. I do believe that connected cars and roadways will make us safer. And I'm gonna, let me explain to you why. There's been a lot in the media about the crashes that have occurred, and indeed they have been tragic. There will be more. And sometimes this is part of the process of innovation, is really developers are learning what has failed in the process of programming these vehicles. And they're going to learn from the mistakes that have been made. All right, so this is uh, as, as you know, the, the Uber self-driving accident that occurred in Arizona, where it uh, was a, a woman on a bicycle stepped in front of an, an Uber car. What you don't see before this picture is the driver is looking down on the phone, doing something, not looking up at the roadway, not ready to engage and like grab the wheel, <laughs> uh, not an attentive driver. And I think this is, this is the problem of Uber and Volvo and others saying, we have autonomous vehicles. People think they can get in the car, just like the Tesla accident that happened where uh, someone was watching a movie on a laptop that had been mounted in the car. Uh, they knew you know, many, many uh, times when the car had said, take control, take control, the driver wasn't listening, he was watching a movie. That is passive driving like a passenger. <laughs> we don't have cars that can do that yet. But the marketing is beginning to, I think, affect people thinking you get in this Tesla you can go take a nap as you, it drives you to your office, and that is not true. That is not safe. Um, these are two incidences. Uh, I've been following this a lot with some of the accidents with the vehicles and really thinking about this isn't really just a safety, and well, safety issue, but it's from a cybersecurity perspective, I think about this as well as what can we do to prevent someone from making this happen <laughs> to the vehicles so, and I know there are great teams at some of these like Lyft, Uber, you know, teams that are making sure or working to improve security. But um, that's the Tesla that uh, was the accident with the person watching the video. And this Uber accident was actually not the car, the driver's fault. Um, it was someone else cut off the Uber car. But the car wasn't programmed in a way that it expected that to happen. This is part of the learning process that's gonna happen with vehicles that are semi-autonomous, and I, I still want to con continue to see development on these. And the, right now, Uber has shut down or stopped temporarily their, um, their, their as I call them, self-driving cars, but uh, I, I, they will be back. Uh, 3M is a very big company here in Michigan, and 3M has, uh, this is an example of how connected cars and your car knowing where you are in relation to stuff around it uh, is, is going to improve security, and this is a roadway in Michigan where it's really like a smart roadway. So the car receives signals that you're approaching a work zone, and it, it makes sure that the car is alerted and the driver's alerted that you need to slow down or you need to move over to the left. So um, there are co companies that are making us safer with the connected cars. So again, I do want to see this technology come to fruition. I don't want to see uh, it being shut down because of safety concerns. And I'll tell you at the end how this sort of relates, well, it does relate to, to computer hacking and thinking in ways of how many ways can I break this system, both from a development perspective and a security like hacker perspective. I look at how I can get into a car remotely, but as developers, how can you create a car <laughs> that sees someone on a bike? And the, the report came out yesterday that the car saw the object, uh, the woman there, it knew it was there. But because they had, had so many false positives, like cardboard boxes blowing in front of some of their cars, they tuned it way down for the sensitivity. So the car did know that the woman was there. It just decided not to stop. So this is part of the learning process of learning how, uh, with coding and development, this is lessons learned. Example, this. 
Uh, this is a project that I've been working on for a couple of years, actually, uh, as a contractor. Uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation knows how critical infrastructure roadways are, traffic lights are, uh, that seems not that interesting from a technological perspective. Oh, but they are. In Washington, D.C., if you could change all the lights to green, like researchers in Michigan did uh, Green Lights Forever, is the name of their, uh, their hacking project, um, that would be a really big problem if you did it during rush hour. I mean, all, <laughs> everything green or everything red. Um, so uh, that kind of thing is um, what we think about if someone could get into the traffic systems and cause, you know, wreck havoc doing that kind of stuff. And there's another project going on that's going to be doing uh, research between connected vehicles and the infrastructure. So what we're doing is working on the roadway uh, transportation security part of it. But um, this, is, this is on the website, so this is all public. Um, but one of the things that uh, I, I thought was really important about this was reporting. As with security and building secure systems, we want to know when there have been problems. And we want to share it with other transportation, like State uh, Department of Transportations around the country. Right now, communications, is, it's difficult. It's, it doesn't, there isn't a one place where someone who's the um, operator of a traffic management system can go and say, I want to know what vulnerability affected this part of the country that seems to have had some ransomware, for instance, um, released on the city that affected transportation as well. We're trying to create a place where there can be reporting for that. And kind of similar to bug bounty program, but it's not a bounty. There's no bounty associated with this. Anyone can report a threat. We don't, I don't just want people from government agencies to be report a threat. Anyone can. So if you're looking at malware and you see that it might have any type of connection to something that might be related to cars or buses or trains or anything with the roadway, we want to know. So uh, this is the beginning, really, of doing a lot of security for the infrastructure, which is very important for, uh, well, for the critical infrastructure protection um, in the US. So um, we're also creating a tool where some of these uh, uh, state departments can do it, like a self-assessment tool for their systems. Um, the cybersecurity framework, the NIST cybersecurity framework is something we're, we're, we're working with, but this is important that we, uh, we kind of take that and turn it to something that transportation can understand. That's one of the problems, I think, with cybersecurity is there's this, uh, kind of like implication and, and general uh, understanding that it's really hard. Cybersecurity is something that we're going to leave to the cybersecurity people to do. And I'm trying to kind of break that. <laughs> I don't want that to be the case because uh, I'd like to see more training and people know that there is training that's out there that's affordable even for, for government budgets. Um, it doesn't have to be like, you know, one week boot camps type of stuff. But um, we're trying to change this very slowly with assessment tools and with creating something like a something like the cybersecurity NIST framework, but only for transportation. Um, so that's something that, uh, this is one of the objectives that's also on the website that we're, we're looking at doing, is trying to get all these organizations together and to communicate and to share vulnerabilities, um, even samples of exploits. I, I want that too. Um, it's important so we can look for, uh, just like, when I worked for the antivirus company, looking for different types of signatures or other things that were unique so we can see if someone has taken a piece of malware and changed it a little bit. So maybe a fix for here would work for a fix over there too. Even though it's labeled or named something completely different, it may have some of the same features as older malware. So, um, so we'll be setting up a framework. So I hope that if you're interested in transportation security, um, as this evolves, um, this is something that Actually, let me show you this. This is what it's going to look like. <laughs> it's very basic. The website is still very basic. It's not graphically very pretty. Um, this is, this is a, a government uh, project. It's not going to be, um, it, it's going to be very utilitarian, let's put it that way. So um, people will be able to send in information. You can too. If you work somewhere where you see something, <laughs> see something, say something, and let us know about it. So uh, we, if we find that it is related to firmware that's also on this type of product and this type of product that you may not have thought would be the same, we would like to uh, push warnings to organizations that have that type of firmware that, hey, this version is compromised. Here's what you need to do to go get the update on it. Um, and the framework, as I mentioned, uh, just like the way the, the NIST cybersecurity framework works, that it was made so that industries could take it and kind of shape it to their, their own type of uh, what their needs. We're trying to shape it to transportation. 
So um, it's, uh, we have many different working groups. I mean, law enforcement's giving input, the industry, meaning the manufacturers of the products that we're, uh, we're taking a look at, and um, uh, they're gonna be giving input, as well as um, uh, people at USDOT, obviously. So we're taking a lot of uh, comments about how we can make this type of project work and be most efficient. Oops, sorry, I think I went backwards. All right, um, here's another report that I found to be really great. And um, some of these organizations are, uh, get funding from like uh, National Academies of Sciences and things like this, but I'm, I wanna show you some of these places where you can go to find resources about what's going on now um, with both legislation, projects that are related to uh, cybersecurity for transportation and protecting these things. Because I must say, we need more people with your skill set that have an interest, uh, and, and even just an interest in cybersecurity and improving this stuff. There are so many jobs that I see go by um, my inbox for the car manufacturers and even the third party manufacturers of products that go into cars, such as the infotainment systems. That is one of the, for what I've seen from car hacking in the past few years, a lot get in through the infotainment systems. So we need some of you to train the, the devs that are doing the software development. Um, this is what um, we think that might be a vulnerability. Look at it from an attack perspective. So if you get this kind of background, you don't have to go back to school to get this. Some people do choose to do the boot camps, and if you can afford that, that's great. But with my students, I use free online training. Um, actually, I promised I would mention this in this. Uh, Hack This Site is a really good it is not malicious, <laughs> but with all of you with your software development, hardware development, mostly software development skills, you'll be able to get through the very uh, final like puzzle pieces, like the phases to go through. There are different levels of hacking you're gonna learn. And if you know how to write scripts and to quickly script up some stuff, uh, that's gonna get you all the way to the top levels in that program. It takes a long time to get through. I have students that did it <laughs> in their spare time and it took them about three to four weeks but you gotta learn how to get in there and change code, make it do stuff it's not supposed to do. And you have a, a really special skill with your background. So if you do have an interest in cybersecurity, Nick, please, the automobile manufacturers want to hire you. And uh, so do people in government too, if you're so persuaded to, uh, to do that. Um, there are many opportunities to help with this so that we are developing security really now in these products. And for some of the vehicles, it is an add-on. We like to train people you know, in the universities like security from the bottom up. You, it's not just something you tack on at the end. Well, it's easy to say if, you, um, if you're developing something from the beginning, but when we have cars out there that, I mean, my car, I gotta I got admit, I, I'm very utilitarian with vehicles. It has 250,000 miles on it. <laughs> These hacks won't work on my car. Um, but yet again, I also can't run all my little CAN bus tools on my car because it's of the, the older CAN bus standard. Um, so, and I don't do that by purpose, I just, I just love this vehicle. But for the new vehicles coming out, we do need people um, that are able to uh, give advice and help the development teams change the way that these are being pushed out and manufactured because uh, it, is a hard, it is a hard task. But you gotta think like a bad guy <laughs> and it's something that you, you can learn to do. And one of the ways is hack this site. Um, there are others like uh, Gruyere, just like the cheese, if you look up that site. And there's um, a password cracking program I have my students do too. Oh, Kane, it's, it's on the, my laptop. If you do download it, it's gonna say like, warning, you got malware on your computer, but what you really have is a pen testing tool. Uh, if you run antivirus, if you, you gotta turn it off for any of these programs I'm listing because um, it'll flag it as you got all these viruses on your computer, but you don't. It's a pen testing tool. Pen testers do not have antivirus on their, their, uh, their testing computers for this reason. Um, so uh, these are some, like Kane is really amazing because it really, you can show people about how easy it is to crack their passwords and how they can write better ones, but you're really teaching students how you can take a concept such as brute force. I mean, we all know what that is and like big O notation, we learn that in the development uh, classes that we take. But how is that stuff utilized to, to break things and how does it make it weaker? That's what you'll learn when you do these types of programs. So, um, all right, so back to the stuff with the, the vehicle is about hmm, really the development of these. And again, and, I'm, and the purpose I'm talking about this is we need to allow the code to be accessible. I do believe through this type of, um, uh, this type of viewing of it, uh, we're gonna have better security, both for security and safety. Okay, so here are the levels of autonomy. So um, 
Does anyone think that there is a number five out there that's not a farm vehicle <laughs> or, or a vacuum, <laughs> like a Roomba type of thing? Maybe? Well, here's the thing. Tesla uh, recently said that they are going to be at level five really soon. But I think it was two weeks ago, it was an executive in an American uh, automobile manufacturer who said, with expletives, that's not true. Um, actually, most of the cars are at number two or three. But yeah, so with three, let me show you this graphic. This, this explains it. So you can look at this picture, uh, feet off, hands off, eyes off, like you saw with the Uber driver. She's on her phone, not watching. Uh, tension off, passenger, like you, you can go to sleep in number five and still get to where you're going safely. We don't have that yet. But we are really somewhere in between two and three, but the way the marketing is going, in fact, it was incorrectly marketed that the new Audi was like a number four, and they pulled back that marketing and admitted that maybe it's like a number three <laughs> right now. So um, I think Audi has recently declared that they're the first automobile manufacturer that is a number three. So um, we don't have this yet, but people believe that we do, and it's, uh, it's concerning. Um, this is where they believe they're going to be with the automobile manufacturers in these, these time periods, so we're getting closer, but you see some at 4 or 5 in 2020. Uh, we'll see if, if we get to that, and, and this is interesting. I'm watching the legislation, too, in, in the states that this is allowed. Uh, I pulled this just last night because um, it's changing so quickly. Um, so there are a lot of states that are going to be doing pilot projects on this, so watch for that. And again, um, getting back to really thinking like an attacker, I'm in all these hacker groups online, and this is a traffic cabinet that controls uh, lights, and this is in Washington, D.C. I don't, someone spotted it and decided to take some pictures of it, post it on a hacker group, and about, uh, about 10,000 people viewed the inside of this cabinet, and it's a whole thread about, here's how you could push this back to the control center via this ethernet port and all that. So um, this is why this is important and a part of critical infrastructure that we're working on protecting this. We just need more people to, to participate and help us with this as well. Uh, this is a project that uh, Southwest Research Institute, which is a pretty big defense contractor, got. They're going to be pen testing traffic lights. So I'm very excited. So if you're interested in this type of work with pen testing, um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that. So how can you get involved in this? Um, I helped with the five-step, uh, it's like a five-step uh, summary of what you can do if you are developing a product, it doesn't have to be cars. What I Am the Calvary does and, and focuses on is vehicles um, and medical devices primarily. But uh, if you read up on this, um, these are some of the things that they tell the companies and the developers this would be important to do. If you want to have a secure product, do these things. So um, here is one that I've been working on. And I don't speak on behalf of SAE or, or Battelle or the companies that sponsor this, but high school, college kids, um, and engineers. So if you work for a company and you're interested in this, check out that website. But you can spend one week on site hacking cars. No, no, I mean, there are no restrictions on it. You can do anything you want. You can brick the vehicle at the end. If that's the way it turns out, that's the way it turns out. They want you to break it. Now, the automobile manufacturers donate these cars, and that's very generous of them, and they're getting, and, and as a result, a lot of information about how people think about breaking into vehicles. As far as I know, this is the only opportunity where you can go and break stuff on cars, <laughs> and uh, they have very strict NDAs. You can never talk about exploits outside of the camp, but it's one week where everything from like high school kids up to like government agents come and learn about this stuff. So this is where the automobile manufacturers and the government uh, come together to talk about how do these students think about breaking this car, including the engineers there who are the developers are learning how to break it. It's such a brilliant idea. And as I want, I want to wrap up some of this presentation with this. This is kind of a uh, every time, no exceptions. What could that mean? OK, so this is, again, is a, a clip from Cory Doctorow, and he's so much of a futurist. but. Um, the cars are somewhat designed with DSRC. Imagine with the hive mind that um, cars, if there's something anom anomalous detected, they tell all the other cars on the roadway, hey, there's a problem up ahead. Everyone move to the right lane or the left lane, and they do it. But what can happen 
if, uh, if some hackers do something. But what can also happen if you allow people to access the firmware on their vehicles to tweak their own, their own firmwares, how shall I say, like, for this? So this is a... Uh... It was Jan's mom who found the Darknet site with the firmware fiddler image, though Jan had to help her getting it installed on a thumb drive. They made two, one for each of them, and clipped them to their phones with the plausible deniability partitions the distributor recommended. The lecture she gave Yan about using it every single time, no matter whether he was in a friend's car or auto taxi, was as solemn as the birth control lecture she'd given him on his 14th birthday. If the alternative is walking all night, then you will walk, my boy. I want you to promise. I promise, Mum. She hugged him so fiercely it made his ribs creak, squeezing his promise into his bones. He hugged her back, mindful of her fragility, but then realized he was crying for no reason, and then for a good reason, because he'd nearly died, hadn't he? Jailbreaking a car had real legal risks, but he'd take his chances with those, considering the alternative. Okay, so this is, um, again, it's fiction. It was Jan's mom oh. who found the dark net. Sorry about that. that site with the go to the next slide. Uh, this is, this is uh, again, very dramatic, but it's a way of saying that we want to be able to know if you find vulnerabilities with your development work. You want your company to be able to have a place where you can go to talk about some of this stuff. Um, the manufacturers should welcome this. Any manufacturer, I'm not just talking about vehicles, but anything safety related, even voting machines, we want to know if there are problems before it's exploited. Because honestly, if you're able to do it, other people have already been able to do it too. They just haven't been very public about it. So um, this is what you can do, is the training. You can go do this training if your company won't pay for it. As I mentioned, there are free programs that you can learn online that my students use too, and they're really good. Um, think about the ramifications of your code and uh, what your employers can do. This is something that uh, I find takes a little bit more push sometimes, but if a lot of people doing software development in your company are like, hey, we want this training, please get this for us. I encourage the employers for this training, do it, even anyone in the company who wants this type of training, if anyone's curious about it, it's useful to you because they're gonna be learning things about this. Um, and also rewarding people that come forward with bugs, both safety related, security related. Like I mentioned, not all companies do this, and sometimes it's, it's hard to change the culture, but you can do this. Um, but, but it takes sometimes more people complaining and saying, hey, I, I wasn't comfortable with the way that that build was done. I think there's some problems. Can we change this next time without fear of losing, losing your job? So essentially, I'm going to end with the Tron, with something from Tron, too, because uh, essentially in Tron, this is the last scene. What is Tron in the program? Okay, watch, I'm gonna show you this clip and you tell me what you think. What is Tron? Oh! He's an anom anomaly in the grid. He violates his programming. The users. So if we call the scene. He'd been reprogrammed, but there was something in him in his programming that still went against um, <laughs> the reprogramming. So when you are the developer and you're thinking about, um, you know, are we ready for this to go to market? Are we ready for this vehicle or this medical device to be sold and released? Think about that. You are the ones who make the decision how the code is produced and developed. You know, you, you work for the user, essentially. You're like Tron. Um, so, <laughs> and Tron saved the day in, in, that, uh, in that clip, but we also want to be sure that you can go to people and say, I don't like how this was done, and you accept if you are a manager at a company. Bug bounty programs are, are part of the culture we're gonna have to accept because you don't wanna find out the hard way that there's a problem with your code. You want other people who may see it a different way to be able to notify you about this. So. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed Tron and an introduction to Cory Doctorow. If you haven't, uh, if you haven't heard of him before, his books are great, and that uh, audio presentation is exceptional. Okay, thank you.